Welcome everyone to CSAC's uh, um, weekly research seminar. Uh, it's a great privilege to welcome today uh, Professor Nita Crawford from Boston University, where she is also chair of the political science department. Um, uh, Professor Crawford has uh, um, uh, a long record of working on issues of uh, uh, international relations, international ethics, and uh, uh, normative change. Um, uh, and more broadly on issues of uh, international security. We're uh, looking forward to hearing uh, about her, one of her current projects, which looks at the intersection of uh, uh, the US military and climate change issues. Um, just a quick reminder as to the format, since we're in a webinar, uh, what we will be doing is uh, um, going over to Professor Crawford's talk for the first part of the session, and that will be followed up by a moderated Q&A. Uh, You'll be able to enter uh, your questions in the Q&A box at any time during the talk, so feel free to start queuing up your questions as uh, the talk progresses. And I will be reading off the questions uh, and moderating the Q&A uh, once we begin. Uh, Professor Crawford, are you ready to start? Thanks so much for letting me join you today. I'll talk very quickly because I have a lot to say about the Pentagon and climate change. and. Um, what I have to today is uh, basically this. I want to talk a little bit about theory and policy by focusing on the Pentagon and its understanding of climate change. And basically the theoretical lens I have is that military, military organizational frames, uh, borrowing from Lynn Eden here, and organizational interests affect the military's understanding of the problem of climate change and the effects of climate change on security. Essentially, the DOD has an understanding of uh, the problem of climate change as a short-term issue. They're concerned with bases mostly in operations and um, the DOD's role in climate change is not part of their understanding. They're overlooking their role in climate change. And the Navy and Marines who are aware of the rise of sea level are ahead of the other services in understanding the longer-term implications of climate change. So that's the the, what the theory tells me and I actually find in the military. Then in terms of policy questions, the DOD is unwilling to rethink their uh, role in emissions and, and they're unwilling to think about forces. And this is in, in the uh, context of a larger uh, shift in global energy supplies and petroleum consumption and their uh, unwilling to look at the causal role of their military emissions, which are significant. So first I'll start with a sort of big picture context, assuming you know nothing about climate change and the role of fossil fuel in war. Then I'll talk a little bit about US greenhouse gas emissions, then how the military thinks, and then how they're not thinking about climate change. So the big picture is emissions have gone up dramatically. This leads to a rise in temperature uh, I'll assume that the science is sound, that CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, water vapor, um, and the fluorinated gases are causing surface temperatures to rise. Now, the problem is that the if we continue business as usual, that is pumping all of these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, global mean temperatures will rise, land temperatures will rise more quickly, Sea level will rise as the polar ice melts. This is nothing new to you, I hope. And um, global, there'll be precipitation in some areas and drought in others. So too much water, too little water. And there's the potential for abrupt nonlinear changes, which could be dramatic. Um, so now, quickly, the military's use of uh, fuel. Okay, on the left, you see the Mayflower 2. This is an, a replica of the first shallop and the Mayflower, so it's obviously oars and wind. And then the US Constitution, again, wind. Uh, we go to coal in the 19th century, early 20th century. Then uh, obviously the need for coaling stations and here are the British coaling stations, which means that empire has to be uh, maintained with fuel. First coal, then oil. And here we see the latest iteration of fuel, which is the Great Green Fleet which has a combination of renewable and fossil fuel power, as, and as well a nuclear aircraft carrier. 
Obviously, fuel's been important historically in war in terms of uh, cutting off the, the tether to fuel for our adversaries, either by sanctions or by directly bombing. Uh, here we see the bombing of uh, oil fields in the 1991 Gulf oil uh, war. Um, and then here, uh, now I want to shift quickly to the current context. Okay. As you know, as Petraeus says, energy is the lifeblood of the military. The United States is a global military presence. And here are just some of the assets of the United States military and everything but the CONUS and Latin America, right? So the rest of the world. And um, this all requires fuel. And it's distributed by the Def Defense Logistics Agency, whose motto is our footprint is global. And uh, I, I put this up because you can also see um, uh, CENTCOM is important here. And uh, it has two uh, ways to get fuel, at least, right? Okay, so here now let's put DOD consumption of energy in the context of uh, federal energy consumption. So what you'll see here in this graph, which is based on uh, publicly available data, is DOD consumption is essentially driving total US government consumption. So total US government consumption on the top, DOD consumption 77 to 87% of um, or 80% of US total consumption. And the smaller picture on the lower left shows that jet fuel is the primary driver of that, followed by diesel. Okay, and here we see um, the more recent petroleum product purchases of 1998 to 2018. Jet fuel is dominant, the dotted line, and then the dashed line is diesel. And here we see DOD energy use by sector. And the, the key thing here is mobility is in the green, the top. And uh, then we see infrastructure, that is um, buildings, bases. Okay, now here I've, I'm showing you energy consumption of the DOD by service. Um, fairly evenly distributed but the Navy is leaner. Okay, and here you see uh, the important role of aircraft across all services for US operational energy use. And operational energy use is different from installation energy use. Operational energy use is 70% of DOD total energy use and installations are 30%. Well, let me just go back actually and, and point out on the, on the right of the slide you see CENTCOM and Pacific Command and European Command and North Command, and there's the rough uh, energy distribution by command. Okay, so why are aircraft so uh, thirsty? Well, because they have poor fuel economy. So my car, uh, the Toyota I have, who's, who's um, uh, catalytic converter, someone is gonna probably try to steal t t today or tonight, um, gets about 50 miles per gallon. And I have a PHEV that gets about 95 miles per gallon. Okay, so here we're talking gallons per mile for aircraft. And that's the real story here. It's tremendously thirsty, these aircraft. And um, now I'm gonna go to the uh, consequence of all that thirsty fuel use, which is that uh, greenhouse gas emissions follow. And here you see my calculations for 1975 to, 20, to 2018 of greenhouse gas emissions of vehicles and equipment, jet fuel and diesel. And here you see my estimate of total emissions from 1975 to 2019. Uh, so the top line, total emissions, and then the red dash line, the middle line, is non-standard emissions. Those are operational emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. And the lower line is the standard emissions, that is installations, bases. There are thousands of buildings on these bases. That's why they use so much fuel. Okay, so 
Now let's focus in on the, the period from 2000 to the last fiscal year for which I have data, which is 2019. And what you see is the, uh, you can, let's go back in fact, you can see here that uh, emissions correlate with military activity, right? And at the end of the Cold War, post 19, and the, and the uh, first Gulf War, post 1991, emissions went down. That's because US activities went down and bases were closed. And then they go up um, following the 9-11 attacks because activity increases and you can see that very clearly. So all along you get a, it, when you have a peace dividend, you have a, a greenhouse gas dividend. And here, focusing in on just the post 9-11 period, you see that um, operations are clearly needing fuel, the, the fuel use and the emissions fluctuate with operations. And if you look at the very tail end of the red dash line, you can, uh, that is the, the 2019, you could see the uptick that occurred in fiscal year 2019, 2018 from US, uh, increased activity in Afghanistan. The number of uh, air sorties went up dramatically to more than 7,000. Um, those sorties it, were also accompanied by a drop, uh, dropping many more munitions in the run-up to the uh, negotiations and the negotiation period. So uh, you can see dramatically sometimes how fuel use is correlated with operations and therefore emissions are correlated with operations. So what does all this mean? In a larger context, the US military emits more CO2 equivalent than many countries in the world. And here, uh, thankfully, Forbes put together this chart based on my data, thank you Forbes, which um, shows US military emissions in, in 2017, um, and then countries which are comparable or smaller that is entire countries emissions. Okay, and here you see it another way. So we saw Portugal and Sweden were comparable to US DOD emissions. And here you see uh, it's a small part of total US emissions, but it is nevertheless significant. And there's new report coming out um, in the UK, I think this week, which totals all military emissions using a different method than I used. And it, it says that aircraft emissions by the military may be equivalent to all uh, other non-military uses of aircraft, which is uh, astounding. Um, but uh, I have to reread that report, so I'm and I don't want to misspeak. But that's quite interesting. Okay, so then I also estimated um, not only total emissions but the the war-related emissions. So uh, what we found was that standard emissions and non-standard emissions were actually quite high. Uh, about a, I'm, I'm estimating it's about a quarter of all total emissions that are related to war. Okay, so what didn't I include in my estimate of US DOD greenhouse gas emissions? Um, the military industry, which I think is about 15% of all US industry, but I'm, I'm not sure about that and there isn't really good data on that. And I, I'm not gonna put out a number yet. Um, nuclear weapons production related emissions, emissions caused by the direct targeting of petroleum, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, emissions of other belligerents, um, reconstruction costs in war. And as we know, things are reconstructed and then they're bombed again. So this is kind of a vicious cycle. And then emissions from other sources, um, such as fire suppression and um, cleaning of uh, uh, burning of uh, burn pits and so on. Um, okay, so how does the Pentagon think about fuel use and climate change? Here's where you're going to get your, your uh, what you came for, which is uh, the military thinks about oil as a strategic asset to protect or destroy. Um, they knew about climate change in the 1990s, but it wasn't a priority. And, and since uh, 2009, it's become an important focus of especially the Navy, but other services, the operational challenges, the question of institutional overwhelm and the potential for increased conflict. So let's just talk about um, the destruction of oil infrastructure. Here I have uh, data that I've um, calculated based on raw um, air power summaries. 
of the number of strikes on uh, oil infrastructure in the war against ISIS from 2014 to 2016. And it dramatically increased in 2016. And so, okay, when those strikes occur, of course, there's fire. Um, another thing we want to note, as I said, uh, the military has been paying attention, especially the Navy since uh, 1990. They're well aware of uh, the consequences for bases and infrastructure of rising sea level and are increasingly concerned about um, a sort of long-term wear and tear on facilities. Um, but they decided, even though they were aware of this, to do nothing about military emissions and in fact took military emissions specifically out of uh, accounting in the Kyoto Protocol. And that's significant. So we, we know, knew, they basically decided not to know about and not to let others know about the consequences of military emissions. And they're really focused on overseas military activity, which as we know, as I've said, that operational use drives um, US military emissions. So what are they focused on? They're focused on decreasing operational vulnerability. Um, and here we see the first operational vulnerability. Um, let's go back actually. Uh, th so that they're, they're trying to be much more efficient. And then we also see that uh, they're worried about attacks on NATO supply convoys in Pakistan of, uh, on their way to Afghanistan. They've tried to decrease vulnerability by just decreasing the amount of uh, fuel that's transited that way, which means increasing efficiencies in Afghanistan, which uh, the Marines have been uh, quite active in doing. But um, we also see that in this, I'm sort of anticipating myself here, that demand for oil uh, fluctuates. It's generally gone up, it's gone down uh, during the pandemic, and it may go down um, even more as we switch to alternatives. Um, but mostly they're interested in reducing uh, operational uh, fuel use um, and therefore operational vulnerability. They're not so much thinking about overall demand um, here we see uh, the way that the DOD has understood climate change as something that they need to adapt to. And uh, much of the focus is on adaptation, less on mitigation. Again, focus on adaptation with uh, you know, responding to and preventing the, the worst damage to bases. And here's a there's their sense of how many bases in the continental United States um, are vulnerable to either too much heat um, or uh, too much water or too little water. And, and here's a base that's vulnerable or bases that are vulnerable. But the key thing is that they've also begun to think about how climate change may lead to conflict. In fact, Locklear, Admiral Locklear has said it's the most likely thing that's going to happen that will cripple the security environment, probably more likely than any other scenarios we all often talk about. Same thing with the Obama administration arguing that climate change is urgent and uh, this continued in the first part of the Trump administration, but then it was sort of taken out, almost redacted verbatim from uh, it, essentially their national security strategy. When this happened, uh, the Congress, members of Congress objected and then um, sent a letter to the Trump administration. So the focus of the folks who are concerned with the climate change as a national security issue are concerned not just with the operational uh, uh, questions, but they're also concerned, as I said, about conflict. And they look at certain conflicts in the world and say, these are exacerbated um, by climate change or fuel use questions. So pipelines, um, civil wars, uh, migration. And some, like the Center for International I'm sorry, the Center for Strategic and International Studies are looking over the long run and seeing the potential for massive disruption in the world, which would lead to food insecurity. And they're sort of um, projecting out that if we keep up business as usual, 
uh, we will see the potential for something that's illustrated here on the bottom, a change in, in uh, patterns of circulation in the oceans, which could prompt uh, these cascading effects, which could lead to enormous food insecurity because the, the Northern hemisphere uh, uh, would not be seizing seasonal, seeing seasonal fluctuations in temperature, which are important for growing. Another group uh, has focused on understanding the threat of climate change and um, promoting what they call a climate security plan for America. The analysis here is excellent, but I, I think it's kind of traditional in this sense. Um, it's, it's saying the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Um, we have to react and it's not looking at uh, the ways that climate change fuels conflict and then taking the next step in understanding how the securitization of climate change actually increases greenhouse gas emissions and then promotes the conflict that they seek to prevent or want to be able to respond to. So they're also not thinking about the changing ways that the United States uh, is gathering the fuel that, it's need, that it needs and uses. In other words, imports from the Persian Gulf have been uh, fluctuating over time, but they're on a downward trend. As the United States diversifies its oil sources, um, you know, more domestic sources, and then also changes the uh, ratio of renewables to um, fossil fuels. So as renewables go up, the need to use, to, to have crude oil can decline if we um, keep all other things equal. Okay, so they're also not thinking about the potential for reevaluating if we're less dependent on Persian Gulf oil, uh, the United States bases in central command or in our global military footprint to the extent that historically it's been in part about protecting access to cheap oil or just pr protecting access to oil. So uh, there's been no rethinking of the central command um, in light of the United States decreased dependence. And in fact, the world's likely increasing, decreasing dependence on Persian Gulf oil. And I think this is a potential missed opportunity. I don't expect General Austin to, or uh, Secretary Austin to, to be creative in this regard. And that's a lost opportunity. Uh, there's also been very little thinking about that strategy of attacking oil fields and its consequences. There, it's hard to measure, um, but I, I think that we can assume that this kind of release of greenhouse gases is uh, vitiating the larger strategy of promoting security, if it's true that climate insecurity will lead to geopolitical insecurity. So here we have those numbers that I talked about earlier. There's um, some thinking about this linkage in uh, academic circles. These are people who've written about this as well as I have. And there are also some thinking about whether this securitization model is actually helpful in the sense that um, we know that governmental capacity, governance capacity can mitigate the consequences of climate impacts. And that's what this work is about. It's showing that uh, even though we fear increased conflict from climate change, it, if we can increase the capacity of governments to deal with both climate and uh, the insecurities that uh, follow from climate change, then we may be able to reduce conflict or at least um, uh, decrease the, the risks of conflict. Um, and here I have other slides, but I can go, uh, I, I wanna stop here essentially and, and, and I've prepared these slides just in case there are any questions about the details of what, I'm, what I've been talking about. But I'll stop here basically uh, with this. Uh, my main argument has been that uh, the DOD is an organization which is doing what, we, what it does, which is prepare for 
you know, the threats that it thinks it's going to face. It's decided that climate change is a threat. I agree with them. Uh, but uh, the way that it's looking at it is sort of short-sighted and narrow, which we'd expect an organiz military organization to do given their organizational frames. And they're going to miss some opportunities for restructuring the military and in particular restructuring central command. If they miss those opportunities, they're likely in fact to be contributing to the risks that they want to uh, mitigate or eliminate. I think you're muted. Thank you so much, Professor Crawford. Um, we now will go to the Q&A uh, session. As a reminder, everybody, just put your questions down in the Q&A box, um, uh, and I will go ahead and uh, uh, read them as uh, 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 they become available. Um, so I think uh, one place where people wanted uh, to start, um, and there's a couple questions related to this, um, is uh, Talk, if you can talk, um, and I'm reinterpreting a little bit here, about trends in, in sort of relative efficiency between sort of military platforms and civilian platforms. There's questions about this in regards to both the overall economy and trends in efficiency in the overall mm -hmm. economy relative to DOD, and then also particularly aircraft. I think it's very striking the figures you showed for military aircraft, whereas commercial aircraft have become more efficient. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe you can talk a little bit to uh, made the incentive structures uh, uh, and uh, bureaucratic limits to uh, taking advantage of some of those trends you might see in the broader economy. Right. Okay. I'll start with aircraft. I think aircraft are um, becoming more efficient. And if if um, you paid attention to that chart, I know it went very fast. The newer aircraft are more efficient. Okay. So the newer transport aircraft, the new uh, attack and bomber aircraft are more efficient. And another way to get efficiencies is to change the flight profiles. And the RAND Corporation has been working with the Air Force to think about how to change the flight profiles. So for instance, takeoff and landing is where you use the, the most fuel, just as in commercial uh, flights. Um, you know, Working with them to change those profiles and to, to uh, um, uh, encourage people who are um, sitting on a runway not to to idle their engines longer than they need to, just as we ask uh, school buses not to idle their engines. So they're looking at efficiencies there. The um, Marines have also been important in looking at uh, efficiencies in a couple of ways. You know, they've done some studies in the uh, like 2008, 2009, 2010 period in Afghanistan about um, keeping tents at the optimal temperature. And they added thermostats to help uh, the Marines do that. And that's actually increased efficiencies. So there, there, there are small efficiencies that um, are, uh, are achievable and some of them have already been achieved. I think that the um, rate reductions though, as you see, are uh, to be had in operational in installation numbers, right? So if, if operations decline, as in after the Cold War, then fuel use declines dramatically. If, uh, as we saw with the base realignment and closure, um, those bases uh, are shut or reduced in um, operations, then you see some greater efficiencies. And there's also been efficiencies in terms of changing the fuel used at bases, you know, moving away from coal natural gas and to some renewables, there's been a slight increase, um, you know, from zero to some um, in terms of renewables, including solar panels and so on. Thanks. Um, uh, we have a question uh, from a couple of people, uh, Michael Wolf and, and a couple of others have asked, it seems like a major way to sort of green the impact of the military would be to uh, both um, shift to sort of shift away from international conflict um, and change perhaps the basing posture of U.S. Mm -hmm. forces, uh, which are now global, but uh, uh, maybe don't need to be that way. It's only really been since World War II that I think that that's really true. Um, and uh, uh, but maybe you could discuss some of the obstacles uh, that you might we might see to such a rethinking of the U.S. basing posture to maybe uh, be more fuel efficient and more sort of peace oriented. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, they point out sort of this is the same way that energy industry re resists decarbonization, won't the military resist uh, a restructuring of its posture to be sort of more efficient and peaceful? Yeah, 
Absolutely, they'll resist because they'll see it as a change in their mission. I mean, it, this has to come from the top. And that's why I'm, I'm not so optimistic about General Austin. Um, I, I don't think that uh, the military has gotten, uh, just by the way they've been reacting to climate change, that they've gotten the tremendous impact their operations and installations have. Um, and uh, this has to come from outside. It's almost like, you know, uh, even though I wouldn't want to do this today, plopping Robert McNamara in there and saying, here, you're going to have to get to be more efficient. And here's how we're going to do it. And here are the eggheads who are going to help you. Okay. This, this isn't going to come from uh, the uh, standard folks. It's, we're ask. I would be, if it were me, and I were in the National Security Council working for John Kerry, I would say we have to rethink from the bottom up these legacy forces and installations and ask ourselves, do they meet the threats, the challenges that we face today and in the future? And instead of, uh, you know, as one of the questioners implied, having sort of legacy from World War II and the, and the Cold War, we would think about, okay, um, do we need this today? And if not, should it be closed? Of course, the base realignment and closure process is highly political, and um, you'd have to think very carefully about just transitions there, and the in the areas where um, uh, you know local economies are heavily dependent on revenue from bases. Of course, they would get, uh, for example, places that they could plant trees and then become carbon sinks, and there's all sorts of positive externalities which people would have to understand. But I, I, I basically think, yes, you're right. This will be resisted. A rethinking on this magnitude would be resisted and it's gonna require some external intervention. Um, and it's a, a follow-up question that relates to that um, is, I, I know you talked about this at the sort of Pentagon level uh, where uh, sort of a potential secretary, um, uh, the nominee for Secretary of Defense, uh, um, uh, General Austin um, has not, it doesn't really have a profile on this issue, but you mentioned Kerry, and I'm wondering to the extent that you're tracking um, what the Biden-Harris transition team is talking about, to what extent other parts of the administration might be able to actually have an impact on the overall profile of uh, sort of the Pentagon's relation to energy use. Is there a discussion sort of outside of the folks that are focused on, let's say, the, 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 the Pentagon? Yeah, I don't think so, um, but I don't know. I mean, they're, they're interviewing maybe, you know, hundreds, thousands of people for these positions, and I don't know who's in Secretary Kerry's uh, purview. I, I do know that um, the person who was handling the national security uh, transition, uh, at least the last I heard was handling it, is a person who thinks more broadly, but um, I'm not sure. I, I'm not optimistic. I think this has to be an analysis that comes from outside. Uh, turning now to a question from one of our postdocs, John Emery. Um, he says, thank you so much for a fantastic talk. I was wondering if you could discuss a bit more the bombing of ISIL oil infrastructure. I know there was initial debates and hesitations about bombing uh, the infrastructure because of concerns over civilian casualties and because it was not the largest source of income for uh, ISIL. Uh, were there longer term impacts of the bombing uh, were the, were the longer term impacts of the bombing weighed by DOD? I don't think so, but I don't know. Um, turning now to a question from Scott Sagan. Um, he says, uh, regarding targeting, uh, could climate change contribution be included in JAG assessments of the precautionary principle requiring the use of alternative weapons or tactics to destroy a, a target? Yes, I, d I think that's correct. But again, that's sort of, you know, on the margins. Um, look, I, I study um, uh, civilian casualties and I, I can tell you for sure that when um, criteria for civilian casualties are in the process for targeting, that saves lives. Um, and, you know, there's no doubt about it. And when rules of engagement change so that um, the targeting is more permissive, then more civilians die. That's clear. I've just published a new paper on that um, for the Cost of War Project that looks at targeting in Afghanistan. Now, if we included uh, concerns about 
greenhouse gas emissions, then we'd have to have an estimate of the emissions that would come from, let's say, targeting uh, an oil field. The problem is that we don't know how long those oil fields would be burning. The, when in, in 1991, oil fields were destroyed by Iraq and, and the destruction of certain oil fields by the US occurred in the most recent period, those fields burned for months, right? Um, now, if they'd been able to get uh, equipment in there sooner, would the fires have been shorter? Yes, probably. But this is a very difficult problem. So I think there's a problem of estimating the greenhouse gas emissions that would come from targeting of those facilities. And um, the other thing that's been targeted are uh, oil storage depots. And um, you, you could look at different points in the, the chain, uh, you know, from getting from oil to distribution to end user, and maybe um, think about targeting those rather than targeting oil fields or um, huge storage depots. Thanks. This uh, question comes from Charlotte Lee, and I'm sympathetic to it, <laughs> um, having uh, tried to teach on energy security at a DOD school, Naval Postgraduate School back in the day. Um, how prevalent is climate denialism amongst decision makers in DOD? Is this a mainstream belief throughout DOD? Is the science of climate change still debated within the Defense Department? I don't know that uh, the Navy has many climate deniers left. They had any after sort of 1990s um, analysis became available. I, I think that the Marines are, are very closely aligned with the Navy's general approach to climate change. There's a very interesting article in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences by uh, a naval officer describing his work on weather and how it led him to understand naval um, the, the, the climate change problem uh, from the perspective of the Navy. Um, if the Air Force were really thinking clearly, I think we uh, about climate change and their contribution to it, I think we'd see uh, changes. But I, I don't I don't know that they are. I think the Air Force and the Army are behind, as I've said. Um, I, but I don't, I haven't interviewed people on whether or not there's climate deniers. Clearly it's not this, the, the current administration, the Trump administration has not been at a place where you poke your head up and say, um, the climate is changing. You keep your head down and talk about other things. This may change rather rapidly. Thanks. Um, let me turn now to a question from one of our uh, postdocs, um, Melissa Carlson. She says, uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Do you think the increasing use of drones and warfare, among other newer types of weapons technology, such as autonomous systems, provides an opportunity to reduce the military's reliance on aircraft and or older, less efficient means of waging war? Um, and maybe we could even broaden the question and think uh, beyond drones, sort of these other new autonomous systems that might uh, sort of change energy use if only just because you're not hauling human beings and support systems around the way mm -hmm. you are now. Yes, I, I think that's true, but I think that's a, uh, it, that's true in the short term. But if you want to take and hold territory, you have to put boots on the ground. And to the extent that U.S. foreign policy demands taking and holding territory um, or trying to support a government in doing the same, uh, then, then you get into these other uses of um, military equipment, which are thirsty. So yes, I, and on short term, yes. So the next uh, question is from uh, uh, Jill Hazleton, who's at the Naval War College and is a visiting scholar at CSAC this year. Uh, she says, a fascinating project. My question is about the notorious ability of the services, the armed services, to slow roll demands for change. Under what conditions is it possible that pressure from the executive and or Congress would actually force the changes you prescribe? Well, it, there's, there are two ways it happens. One is if the military sees this as their, in their interest, and that would require um, making the steps clear that I've tried to make between military fuel use, um, greenhouse gas emissions, and the potential for conflict. So th what they've got is global emissions the protection, and the potential for conflict, but they haven't gotten their contribution. I think we have to make that clear, That's one thing. So I'm, you know, in other words, uh, epistemic communities and belief change and evidence and argument. The other thing is, as I've 
indicated before, I think this has to be um, something that's a priority from the executive that's outside the, the DOD, the National Security Council, looking at um, a larger sustainability strategy and a larger security strategy that um, is, you know, starts afresh. The, the public and um, intellectuals, like the people who work at the Naval War College and everywhere, you know, uh, all the Naval, I'm sorry, all the military academies and um, associated think tanks, they can, they can play a role here in providing the evidence. Um, but if the response is we have to be prepared to go meet the Russians in the Arctic when the water is clear year round, if that's the response, it's, it's really not responsive to the scale of the problem. So I, I think it demands sort of bigger thinking and that um, will likely have to come from outside. Thanks. Um, uh, next question is from uh, Benoit Pelopidas. Um, he says, uh, many thanks for your talk. I would be interested in hearing more about how it was decided that military missions were not included in the reporting on the Kyoto Protocol. Who made the case, who decided, and why? Right. Uh, it came from the DOD, and uh, the DOD pushed the negotiators not to include it. And then, therefore, in the Clinton administration, um, the negotiator Eisenstadt, Sir Eisenstadt, did, did not allow it to be included. So it was agreed to, uh, at, you know, then at the State Department, and it's, it's State Department military uh, uh, agreement. I'm not sure at the National Security Council level what, uh, if uh, President Clinton understood the implications of that. Uh, I doubt it because um, uh, they didn't have the data that I have, that I've calculated and a few other people have calculated that data wasn't there, wasn't available to them. Um, no one, it, even today, the members of Congress are not given by the DOD uh, how much fuel they're buying. They're given a budget to buy fuel, but the DOD doesn't explain to them how much fuel they're buying. It's very hard to get the big picture unless you're looking for it. So I think that it was a, the priority was military necessity. It was not explained to, to um, as far as I can, I, I can see, it was not explained to them that, that here are the consequences. And I think that's in line with that short-term perspective that I described earlier. Thanks. Um, uh, next question is from Ken Schultz over in uh, Political Science. Um, he says, uh, a former grad student of ours who is also an Air Force officer did research showing that messages about climate change from the military, emphasizing its national security implications, were effective in moving public views, especially among Republicans who see the military as one of them. Mm -hmm. Do you think the military could or should play a constructive role in changing public attitudes on this issue? I think it has already. Uh, I agree with that. Um, Michael Clare, whose book I cover, I showed earlier, argues in his book, among many other things, that the military can lead and can show that this is not a red issue or a, a blue issue. It's a national security issue. And they can lead in, in terms of innovation. I think it already has. You know, I, I also think that um, these demonstrations, the Great Green Fleet, or the solar panels, or the uh, efficiencies show what is possible. And the military is showing what is possible in terms of innovation in harsh environments. Um, I think that, yes, they can provide that kind of example, and they already have. Thanks. Um, we have a question from uh, one of our anonymous participants, um, which is uh, a comparative question. What steps are other countries taking to approach climate change from a national security standpoint? And uh, are you seeing any approaches that the United States can benefit from using or adopting or learning from? That's a great question, President-elect Biden. And I don't know the answer to that question. Um, you know, I'm just uh, thinking about the report that's gonna come out from um, a global north-south coalition, I can't remember the exact title of the organization, that will 
try to put pressure on militaries besides the US to think about their greenhouse gas contributions. Um, and we'll see, but that's a great question. I don't know. Great. Um, another question from uh, one of our uh, anonymous uh, participants. Um, uh, this one actually gets at the, the military's use of fuel. Um, and sort of one of the early earlier questions uh, had talked about maybe if we had uh, changed uh, deployments or basing, uh, uh, could you uh, adopt a more fuel efficient posture? And their question is on the given the fuel usage you're seeing, how much of it is for operational use and how much of it is just for training? Because if there's a significant amount used in training, then maybe it's the, the basing posture is not might not be as helpful as it might appear at first glance. Mm -hmm. Right, so I think we can get a handle on that in, in looking at what's going on in NORTHCOM. North, NORTHCOM has um, the highest use of energy um, of the commands, and then it's followed by Central Command. Okay, so clearly there's a lot of basing and uh, training there. Okay, so a lot of that uh, is training, but uh, you need to have the training to do the operations, right? And um, they just they go hand in hand. Um, so I think that uh, there are two things that are happening at the end of the Cold War, which are, are really in, important here. One is the decrease in the number of installations and bases, base, base realignment and closure process, which finished in the early 2000, early 2000 period. And the other is the decrease in um, training and um, joint operations. And um, the, I, I, I haven't been able to pull that apart, right? But we know the installation energy use decreased. So some of it has to be since the United States was not, except for 1999, really engaged in a lot of um, uh, airstrikes. Um, and in, of course, 1991, um, some, it, a lot of that decrease has to be due to decreased training. So, I, but this is a very important question. I haven't answered it. That's that's great. Um, I I think that uh, um, again we have to think about you know what are marginal efficiencies and what would be a major economy by closing entirely a base or saying that we don't need uh, one to two aircraft carriers in the Persian Gulf at all time uh, with their associated ten surface ships. Right, so that uh, uh, we could also then close some of those bases. If you rethought that, you'd see a dramatic decline. Um, you could also, with the bases in North America, um, actually uh, change their energy profile so that they were producing renewable energy. And you, if you planted trees on them in these closed bases, you'd reduce the heat island effect and you'd also be um, a carbon sink. So could the Pentagon lead the US government in becoming net zero? That's, that's a potential, at least in certain regions. Thanks. Um, so uh, at, so that we, we're running out of time. We have a ton of open questions. I've been trying to merge questions uh, uh, where I can. Um, but uh, let's go back to uh, Michael Wolf from Stanford's history department. Uh, he's a professor there. Um, yes, do you think John Kerry would be receptive to your work if he saw it? If not him, who else would you like to brief in the incoming Biden-Harris administration? Noting we might even have one or two members of the transition team <laughs> on uh, uh, this session. Well, um, uh, I'll give them my resume at any moment. And there, um, there are, uh, people on Senator Warren's staff who've actually been working on this, and I, I briefed Senator Warren's staff. I briefed a lot of the um, staff on this, the, the uh, of di the different members, but most of the presidential, the twenty-something members of uh, uh, the Democratic Party who ran for president got briefings by the Cost of War Project, and and some of those people are be going into the administration, I, I suspect, and they've heard some of this information before, um, but. Clearly, somebody in the National Security Council at the level of um, uh, Secretary Kerry um, is somebody I'd like to, to talk with about rethinking in a more imaginative way. But 
Yeah, it's all, it's, you guys can do this too. You can raise these questions yourself. So um, let me turn now to a question from Lieutenant Colonel Kershaw, uh, is a Marine student at the U.S. Naval War College. So it's a fascinating presentation, Dr. Crawford. Uh, you mentioned CENTCOM as a potential opportunity to disengage and reassess due to decreased reliance on Middle East oil. I've also heard that a hard look at overseas basing posture as a potential emission savings. What other opportunities for strategic military uh, changes uh, uh, or pol uh, policy changes do you see uh, after those sort of top two? Mm -hmm. Yeah, North, Co North Command, um, base realignment and closure. Also, you know, keep in mind that, that the uh, DOD and the sort of national security elites, all of us have been thinking about eventually we're going to be able to make that turn, pivot, swivel, whatever it is to the Asia Pacific region or the Indo-Asia Pacific region, however broadly you're thinking about it. I think that we need to think about whether or not we want the competition between the United States and China to be on this territory. Well, it, should we actually be moving assets there? Should it be the case that instead of a 50-50 division between you know, the Navy um, in the Atlantic and the Pacific, we, we do want to go to the 60-40 uh, with 60% in the Pacific. I don't know that we need to do that. I think we need to, there, there are opportunities for economizing there. And, and so that's what I mean by thinking uh, more creatively. I, it seems to me that to sort of reignite a, uh, or ignite a Cold War with China is um, uh, cutting off your nose to spite your face. And, and you know, there are lots of reasons I don't like Chinese domestic policy and foreign policy. But one thing I do like about their uh, policy is the fact that uh, they are very aggressive in alternative energy and they're leading the world. And when we see uh, uh, th these kinds of innovations, which make possible the scaling back of the reliance on fossil fuels, uh, then I, I think we need to cooperate more. And, and in fact, maybe we, you know, increase the rivalry on those terms rather than um, sort of worrying about who's patrolling what area in the Pacific. And, and I'm being very blunt because it's clear to me that more lives are at stake from climate change than, um, you know, confrontations in the Asia Pacific region, unless they become nuclear, then all bets are off, right? But um, climate change will kill has already killed more people than many wars. And we also have to keep in mind that zoonotic diseases, which are part of the uh, consequences of, uh, of environmental degradation, the pushing out of humans into areas where they weren't before, humans eating um, things that they didn't used to eat, um, that these zoonotic diseases like COVID, like Ebola, like swine flu, like bird flu um, are, uh, they, they will kill more people than hot wars. So I think we have to think very carefully about China's role in, and the Asia Pacific in general in um, the, the next five to 10 years. It could be that we could also decrease there and should. Well, and maybe one last, I think, related question from Rose Gottemuller. Um, it's, um, uh, how would you grade NATO and its collective efforts at energy efficiency? Um, so the sort of the, the people you're pivoting away from, what, what is the debate there on um, um, sort of uh, climate change and energy efficiency? Well, in general, the Europeans are better on these questions. Um, they're much more efficient than the United States, um, but I'm not sure how well it's translated into the military. So I, I, again, it's a sort of, I don't know, good, it'd be a good area to do research. I would imagine that since um, the uh, European aviation industry has been, and the, the people who monitor and keep track of aviation in Europe has been better at talking about the things that we don't know about jet fuel emissions and have been doing a better job at calculating the jet fuel emissions that they're, they're probably more advanced. So, um, and, and why is that important? I, I told you some greenhouse gas emissions for jet fuel that were based on sort of traditional assumptions. There is the problem though, and the Europeans are ahead on this and trying to understand it, uh, of the water vapor 
that comes from jets flying higher. And that uh, has greenhouse gas, uh, that it has warming consequences. And the Europeans are ahead in thinking about this um, and uh, ahead of our EPA. So I wouldn't be surprised if they're thinking more about their profile for flying uh, more than we are, though I don't know. That's a good question. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time we have, even though we have many, many more questions uh, from the audience. Uh, please everybody join me in thanking Professor Nita Crawford, uh, Chair of the Political Science Department at Boston University uh, for uh, her talk on the Pentagon and climate change. Thank you so much. <laughs>